So living in wonderful New England uh, last summer, friends of mine came up to visit, and we went up to New Hampshire, and you're seeing a picture here from Cannon Mountain, and we were coming down uh, the tram, and I just took this beautiful picture, and it just kind of, doesn't it just make you want to go there, right? Isn't it beautiful, right? How good is, you know, how, oh Lord my God, when I an awesome wonder, right? Well, so my friends, they have a, they have a son who I think is like, he's going to be one of the great, he is, he's, he's like uh, a blossoming theologian and evangelist in our country. And um, he's amazing. And when we were, oh, that's a picture of him right there. That's, his name's Andre. Maybe we can show the next picture too. Ready? Watch this one. How cute is that? That's Andre. So we're going down the tram, and little Andre, he sees like this beautiful view, and he starts singing randomly. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from... Where did he get that? Like, where did that come from? Right? I mean, out of the mouth of babes, right? But it says, it does... Excuse me, my voice is changing. It does say... <laughs> how's that funny? Okay. It does speak a truth, though, right? Reveal something profound about who we are, that we are created for worship. And this, in, in, in his innocence, he's just moved to sing. Well... Really funny. So later on, we're at the what's called the Flume Gorge, and uh, I had I had separated from them. I was with my uncle and uh, my godson, and we were just a little delayed. And the Vretts, they got a they have a contingent of kids, so they were just a little you know kid check in time, do what they need to do, you know. So I hear this story afterwards. So we happen to pick the week. It was really funny. The week in which these this community of Hasidic Jews were descending upon New Hampshire. And everywhere we went, they were there. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. So, families taking a breather, gathering themselves up. And a family of Hasidic Jews starts walking by. And at the same exact moment, a family of Muslims walks by. Muslims, Jews. Muslims, Jews. What does little Andre start to do? Ready? Wasn't even rehearsed. It wasn't... Out of nowhere, we wish you a Merry Christmas, we wish you a Merry Christmas, we wish you a Merry Christmas, and a Happy New Year. You can't make it up. That really happened. That's true. Okay, so I want to show you a picture of my parents' dog. This is Rocco. Let me see a picture of Rocco. There's Rocco. Isn't he cute? He's the cutest face, huh? So my mom, my mom has some disabilities. My mom's been a daily communicant for many, 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 many years. And so um, certain times during the week when she can't get a ride to Mass, I'll come and celebrate Mass for my mom. And so it's just me and my mom having Mass with Rocco. And we have this routine, every time I come in the door, he comes running up and he greets me and he's so excited, and then he runs into the room, and then he just starts eating his treat, dog treats, cookies, whatever, fine. He finishes his retreats, I kid you not, and at this point as he's finishing his treats, I've set up the altar and we're ready to go. And the dog sits at the foot of the altar and just stares at me. <laughs> With that face. Now I'm like, Lord, like, it's really hard to pray with this cuteness looking at me, you know what I'm saying? Like, I got to concentrate. Do you know what it's like, like, trying to, like, my mom's doing the readings to not look at the dog because he's just staring at me like, I love you. I love you, you know? Okay. So my mom made this comment one time, and it's really funny. She said, you know, Matt, I think Rocco's been to more masses than most Catholics. And I laughed and I said, Ma, I think you're right. I think he has. But here's the thing, and this is what's kind of interesting. So like, for the liturgy, it's like clockwork. The liturgy of the word, he's, he's all into it. And he's focused. But then when we transition to the liturgy of the Eucharist, I don't know what it is. It, but he leaves the floor 
and he jumps up to the couch, and he gets into a ball, and he sleeps. Like during the Liturgy of the Eucharist. I, you know, it's almost like he's listening attentively, and then he goes like, rest in the Lord, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> with that being said, though, with that being said, as, as I said earlier, you know, Rocco's been to more masses than most Catholics, yet I've never seen him make the sign of the cross once. When I say, the Lord be with you, he doesn't say, and with your spirit. Like, he doesn't respond. He hasn't figured out, like, how to worship yet. Because he's a dog. And dogs are not created for worship. But guess what? We are. Amen? We are created for worship. We are created for worship. It's how God has created us to love him. We are created to worship God with all of our mind, heart, soul, and body. We're created for worship. And if we don't worship the one true God, we will worship other things. We will worship false idols. That's true. You're created for worship. So if you're not worshiping Jesus, you're going to worship something else. That's true. It's true for everyone. It's true. You're created for worship. You're created for worship. When we worship God, we make a sacrifice. Because every act of worship involves a sacrifice. Ancient Israel, temple worship involved a sacrifice. Even, even in the pagan cults, Worship invited, in, involved sacrifice. At the heart of every Mass, there's a sacrifice. Jesus offers his very life for us in the Holy Eucharist. His cross is made present in every Mass. So worship entails sacrifice. Worship is always a sacrifice, an offering of our hearts, of our wills, of our lives, of our soul, of everything of who we are. To love himself. That's worship. And when we worship God, we are awakened. When we worship God, we're awakened to truth. Remember we talked about truth this morning. We're awakened to truth. The truth of who God is and who we are as his beloved children. That inheritance that we heard Debbie speak about. We're awakened to the truth of who God is and who we are. We're awakened to the truth about God's power and his purposes for our lives. When we worship God, we start to get into the river of the Holy Spirit and we start to experience and taste that which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. And we start to get into that flow of the Holy Spirit where we say it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And we allow God to live his life in us. Amen? Amen. That's the worship that we're called to every day. You're not called to worship God one conference to the next or one Sunday to the next. We are called to be a worshiping people every day. Every day. Every day we are invited for worship. Amen? Amen. Every day you and I are called to worship. The church affirms this in the Liturgy of the Hours. In the Liturgy of the Hours. The Office of Readings. Morning prayer, daytime prayer, evening prayer, night prayer. In the Liturgy of the Hours, it's so that we pray without ceasing. Priests make promises. Consecrated persons make promises. Deacons make promises to pray the liturgy hours faithfully, worshiping God and for the body of Christ, the church, and the world. We're to be a worshiping people. We have to write that into our system. If if you were to ask me, what's the problem? And so uh, we could go on for hours about problems. So I don't want to say like this is the the problem. But a significant problem among disciples that I see, which I guess maybe begs the question of your disciple. They don't pray enough. This is what I, I see good people, like the, the top 10 percenters of your parish, and they don't have a daily prayer life. They don't worship God. They don't seek to become a sacrifice when they pray, giving God their heart. Now, this is hard stuff. I understand. It's hard to, to kind of leap in and give God your heart. But, like, ultimately, that's what we've got to be heading. Or else we're going to be stagnant in our prayer, and we're going to be stagnant in our call to discipleship. Worship involves a sacrifice, and ultimately, it's about giving him our lives, our hearts, everything of who we are, becoming one with his divine will. You were created for such a time as these. Look at your fingerprints real quick for a second. I want you to just look at your fingerprints for a second, okay? So how many people in the world today? Seven point something billion, maybe 7.5 billion people in the world today. Do you know that no two people have the same fingerprints? Do you know that? No two people have the same, even identical twins. You do not have same, single, same fingerprints. It's really true. 7.5 billion people 
and you're looking at a one-of-a-kind set of fingerprints. You know what that makes you? It makes you unique. You are unique. There's no one like you. There's no one like you. You are a unique masterpiece that comes from the heart of a master creator. And the reality is because we don't believe in incarnation, reincarnation, there never has been and there never will be another you. You know what that makes you? Unrepeatable. Each and every one of you is a unique, unrepeatable masterpiece, gift from the heart of a master creator. Can I get an amen? Amen. That's really true. Unique, unrepeatable, masterpiece gift. Gifts are meant to be given away. Our hands are symbolic of our service, of our lives, of our, of our work, right? Hands are so important. They're so symbolic of giving, of offering. So in the history of the world, God could have created you and I. He could have created us to live in 1808. He could have created us to live in the year 1016. He could have created us to live in the year 2515. He created us for some reason in, in God's wise and loving providence. He created you and I to live right now, which means this. If you're a unique, unrepeatable masterpiece, that means that the God of the universe has a unique, unrepeatable plan, master plan that only you can fulfill. Get busy. Which means you were created for such a time as these. That comes from the book of Esther. You were created for such a time as this. You were created for greatness. I love the way greatness is, 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 uh, what's the word I want to use? Defined. Couldn't, had a blank moment there. I love the way greatness is defined by Jesus to St. Faustina in her diary. In this is greatness for God. Love of God and humility. God says you want to be great? Love God and be humble, which makes complete sense. Because if you're loving God and being humble, you're saying, yes, let it be done unto me. It makes complete sense. Because God knows what he's created you for. And so our job is to say yes to him, right? And so if we love in God and worshiping him, and we're humble, we're going to allow him to live his life in us. Because that's ultimately what being a Christian is about. Mary is the ultimate, she's the God bearer, right? The word became flesh in her womb. But each and every one of us who have been born again by water and in the in the by water and baptism, right? Who have been born again, Christ lives in us. Unless we've committed mortal sin, we've got to go to confession. But Christ lives in us. And we are God bearers in a, in a similar way. And we're called to bring Christ forth into the world. Will we allow Jesus to live his life in us? This is a question of discipleship. Will we allow Jesus to live his life in us? And I'm telling you right now, it's really hard to do it if you're not praying. It's really hard to do it if you're not worshiping God. It's hard to do it if you're not fasting. Worship is essential. It's essential to allowing God to live his life in you. Bishop Barron puts it this way. He talks about the theodrama versus the ego drama, right? And the ego drama is like, hey, guess what? I produced this play, I'm directing this play, and guess what? I'm starring in it, right? Ego drama. It's about the trinity, me, myself, and I. That's, I use, I use that. That's not Bishop Barron. He wouldn't say it like that, right? But it's all about me. And think about that in, in, in our Facebook culture, right? I mean, it's all about your profiles and your status, and look at, we're so narcissistic. Oh, my word. It's all about me, my selfie, right? Okay. And Barron says this, Bishop Barron says, he says, you know what, the ego drama gets boring after a while. And that's really true because you're creating your own adventure and your own adventures get boring sometimes. That's why I always kind of keep looking for something else. You're looking for the next love that's going to make you happy, right? But like he's saying, when you enter into the theodrama, in other words, like we want God to live his life in us, it's so exciting because you like encounter women at the jelly aisle and like God gives you a chance (laughs) to do something really cool, right? I've passed by many women at the jelly aisle, believe me. But the question is, will we allow Christ to live his life in us? That's the truth. And I love the, the, the St. Paul, Galatians 2.20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ, and the life I live is not my own, 
Christ lives in me. And the life I live is the life of faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. He's, that's a mystical statement there. It's, it's about baptism, and it's mystical. He had this profound sense, and he lived it. This profound sense that he's died with Christ in baptism, and Christ lives in him. That's what we're called to. That's what this theodrama is all about. Sometimes we can feel, though, that our mission is a mission impossible. When we think of the chaos of our work, the chaos of family life sometimes, chaos of the neighborhood, of the wider family, the political situation, the country, the world, we're like, ah, like, what am I supposed to do? It's so hard to be a Christian in all these places. And never mind that, I was going to say, like, we walk into these places that are like, because if we're called to be awakened, right, they're all spiritually drowsy, they're in a coma. They're not drowsy. Most of them, they're in a coma. Now here's the thing, disciples of Jesus. If you, where's my voice going tonight? <sighs> Stop it. If you're walking into those arenas, those coma zones, oh, I like that, you get it? Coma zone? Like, yeah, that's pretty good. Coma zones. If you're coming into those coma zones, I like that. Spiritually drowsy yourself, that arena, that zone, does not have the ability to wake you up. So you're going to start heading into coma. You got to go into work. You got to go into your families. You got to go into your community, society. Clothed, equipped, awake. Or else you're going to fall victim to the drowsiness of the culture. So often we might go to work looking for work to affirm us and to build us up. And the reality is you can't give what you don't have. And if the workplace isn't a holy environment, and you're not going in there awake, you're going to get swallowed alive. But if you're clothed in glory, if you're clothed in the praises of God in worshiping Him, if you're going into work awake, you then stand the chance to be a profound light of Christ into the darkness. But you'll never be able to give what you don't have. And if you're not worshiping God, with all of your mind, heart, and soul, if you're not seeking him in worship, daily worship, and giving him your heart and your life, you are not going to have an impact. You'll be no threat to the devil. I'll say that again. You'll be no threat to the devil. You'll be no threat to the devil. But this is the hour for the church to wake up. This is the hour for disciples to worship, to seek God in worship, to fast, to be a threat to the devil. You know... You can work with anthrax if you're clothed properly for it. I know that's an extreme example, but it's true. But if you're not clothed with it, it'll kill you. If you're clothed with the praise of God in worship, if you've been worshiping the living God, and you are allowing that spirit to live, and you know where you can be affirmed and strengthened, then you can walk into those situations, and you're not looking those situations to affirm you or to build you up, because you know whose you are and who you are. You know God's power and purpose for your life, and you're going in there to change lives, because you're on a mission from God. You're there to bring Christ into that situation. So don't look for these environments, these coma zones. Don't look for them to be a blessing into your life if they're not made to be that way or if they're not transformed. You go to Jesus for that. You go to your peer communities for that. You go to your spiritual directors for that. You go to your priests for that. You go to worshiping Christian, you know, Christians who will gather in a community. Your peers, you go to them for that. You get built up by the community. You get built up by, by praising God, by seeking Jesus. And then you go into these places awakened so that you can be a threat to the devil. Amen? To understand what worship involves, 
I want to look at the Mass. Because the Mass gives us the most beautiful paradigm example of what worship is. The sacrifice of the Mass. So you might have heard the story out of Poland of a Eucharistic miracle. In the year 2013, during Christmas, parish church in Poland, I, don't, I forget what the name of the town was, they're celebrating Holy Mass, and it's communion time, and one of the hosts fell to the ground. And the pastor, being a good and holy pastor, picked up the host, and he put it into a, a vessel filled with water so that the Eucharist could dissolve, so they can be poured into this aquarium and then properly disposed of. That's how we, that's how we dispose of, in a, in a holy and in a venerable way, the Holy Eucharist when things like falling to the ground happen. When Father came back a period of time later, he noticed there were blood spots on the host, and something had happened. It had changed in appearance. So immediately he starts working with church people and science people to start looking at what is going on here. What is going on here? What happened to this host? And the medical community said this, the final medical statement by the Department of Forensic Medicine found and this is the quote. In the, uh, correct me if I say this wrong, histopathological image, the fragments were found containing the fragmented parts of the cross strated muscle. I guess that's part of the heart. It is most similar to the heart muscle. Okay? Then listen to this line. Tests also determined the tissue to be of human origin. Notice it wasn't from a duck <laughs> or a squirrel or a sequora, whatever you call those flying bug things. Cicada, that one, yeah. <laughs> Tests determined the tissue to be of human origin. Ready? And this, this, is, this is the kicker right here. And found that it bore signs of distress. What's one of the words for Mass? The way we refer to Mass. The holy what? Sacrifice of the Mass. So God gives us these wonderful miracles, I think, to affirm us in our faith. You know what this says to me? You can show the next slide. You know what this says to me? That every Mass, Jesus gives us his heart. That Eucharist that became heart tissue that was distressed. Every Mass, God comes and He gives us His heart. Out of all the gifts that God could ever give us, there's no greater gift He gave us than His Son, Jesus. And there's no greater gift that Jesus gave us than His very heart. Every Mass. Now, let's step back for a second. On the cross, Jesus' sacrifice, he offered his entire self to the Father for the salvation of the world. That was the most perfect act of worship. He offered his heart. And in the Mass, that heart is made present for us sacramentally. Brothers and sisters, to worship is to give your heart to Jesus. Nothing less. Does he have your heart? When we come to Mass, do we give him our hearts? When we come to pray, when we worship God, do we offer a gift of our hearts, of our lives, to the Lord, as he does for us? And when that heart-to-heart -heart giving and receiving happens, we have Holy Communion. We have Holy Communion. During the offertory, we bring forth gifts of bread and wine. Bread, which is the work of human hands, the wine, the work of human hands, right? But the bread, the wheat, the wine, the grape, ultimately these are fruits of the earth. And Father Barron even talks about this and he says, you know, just consider this, right? That, you know, the fruits of the earth, the, the wheat and the, the grape, the four basic elements of creation are involved in bringing those about. Earth, air, fire, water. Earth, air, fire, water. All of those 
are involved to help bring about fruit, the grain, the grapes, which then through the work of human hands become bread and wine. So Barron says this, Bishop Barron says this, that at every offertory, the church is bringing the cosmos, all of creation to the altar as gift to the ultimate gift giver. And tied into that is you and me, our hearts, our lives. That offertory is not just a warm fuzzy for you to put your money in the collection basket. That offertory is symbolic of a truth that you are called to be sacrificial. You're called to give your life and your heart to Jesus on the holy altar. A heart-to-heart -heart giving and receiving. That bread and wine represent us bringing the cosmos as an offering to the gift giver, the creator of the universe. That's really true. That's really true. The pagan world takes those very things and worships them. And if we're honest in our own struggles, we probably find fruits of those things and we probably worship them as well. When you're not on your A-game as a Christian. We call that idolatry. We call that idolatry. We're called to make an offering. We're called to make an offering. I want to show this quote from the Catechism. In the catacombs, the church is often represented as a woman in prayer. Arms outstretched in the praying position. Is that not an offering position or what? How about this? Like when little children come running to the, to the arms of mommy and daddy, right? Mama, daddy, surrender, offering, or stick them up or I'll shoot. <laughs> or praise and worship. Offering, written into our earliest days is this reality of an offering of ourselves. Like Christ who stretched out his arms on the cross, through him, with him, and in him, she offers herself and intercedes for all. Do you know how you catch a monkey? Like, what? What's, where did that come from? What's that? So there's a story on how you catch a monkey. You do this. You take a coconut, and you put a hole in it, and you affix it to like a tree or something, so it's like permanently fixed there. And you put a banana inside, but the banana... As you put it in there, yet the hole is, is small enough so you get the banana in and so that the monkey can get its hand in. But when the monkey grabs the banana, it can't get its fist out or the banana out. And they say, I've never done this at home, so I don't have like personal <laughs> accounts for you. But they say that the monkey won't let go of the banana. And so you catch a monkey. Get it? You're not following me, people. Hello, hello. <laughs> what are your bananas? What are you holding on to? What are you worshiping? What am I worshiping? What are we holding on to? When you come to Mass, you lay down your idols to worship the true God. You sacrifice your idols to the true God. We give Him our idols, our fear, our shame, our sin, those things that we're holding on to, anger, pride, anger, lust, envy, gluttony, avarice, sloth, you name it. We give Him our idols. We give him our sin. We offer it, the things we're attached to. Because ultimately, when we worship God and we offer, we're supposed to, like, it's becoming detached of those idols. The bananas, baby. Let go of the banana. So I want to read, I love Catechism Quote 2097. It says this, the worship of the one God sets man free from turning in on himself from the slavery of sin and the idolatry of the world. I'll say it again. The worship of the one God sets man free from turning in on himself from the slavery of sin and the idolatry of the world. Brothers and sisters, worship is so important it brings us out of ourselves, that there is a God and it's not me, in case you didn't know. Right? But it orders our, right, Bishop Barron talks about right praise. When we're, not, when we're not worshiping God and putting him first, our worship gets off, our praise gets off. But when we start worshiping God, we put him forth 
as our spiritual compass, our north star, and order everything else accordingly. We come out of ourselves. God starts to shake us up, if you will. Or our worship aligns ourselves with heaven and those sh the chains fall off. Worship helps us to order and set ourselves on what is true, good, beautiful. It helps us to set our focus not on ourselves, but on God and his purposes. I couldn't help but think of Acts 16, verse 25 and 26. So Paul and Silas, they're in prison. And they're, they're, uh, their feet are in stocks. And it says this. It says, but about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and they were singing hymns to God. So they were worshiping. They were worshiping. Get it? They were worshiping. They weren't allowing the facts to dictate their circumstances. They were trusting in truth. And they were worshiping God and praying for God to do something. So in the midst of their imprisonment, in the midst of their chaos and pain and disappointment and confusion and frustration and maybe despair, I don't know, or the temptation to it, they start praying and worshiping God. And the other prisoners looked on. They're like, what? So as they're praying and singing hymns to the Lord, so they're worshiping God, what happens? And suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately, all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. Do you get it? When you worship God, you get out of yourself. You break away from the things that bind you and hold you down. We break away from the lies that you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you're too fat, you're too thin, you're this, you're that, you're not worthy, you're not honorable, you're not beautiful, you're not worth fighting for, you don't have what it takes to be a man. All those lies, all that junk, all that stuff. In our sin, it weighs us down and we, we just... We start to think this is our identity, and we, we don't live, we live, we fall asleep entering into the coma zone. I'm going to use that in the future, by the way. Anyways. It really happens. But what does worship do? It starts to wake us up to the truth of who God is, who we are, and his power and purposes. Amen? So worship. Thank you. It's so important. You've got to make time for worship every day, every day, every day. Because it shakes the chains of slavery and the old man away and helps us to live in the new light of Christ. Amen? That's what we need to seek. It helps us to awake. Helps us to awake. Okay. Now, I want to shift a little bit to another aspect of worship. Not only does worship shake the chains away and awakens us, now that we're awake, now that we're awake, we can enter into the inner room and make a true, sincere gift of love to ourselves, of ourselves, to our Savior. We are at a Power and Purpose Conference. A number of people went through the Life and the Spirit seminar today, which is wonderful. How many people went through the Life Spirit today? Isn't that awesome? All right. Good job. That's wonderful. And for those who have been, in the, who have been involved in, in uh, the Life and Spirit ministries and charismatic renewal and all this stuff, like, so like, we're all familiar with being in the upper room, right? The upper room is that place where we're all there. We're praising God and we're asking for His gifts. Lord, just give me the gifts that I need. Lord, just give me the gifts that I need. Lord, just give, if I just had this, Jesus, I could do this. If I could just have this, I could do this. If I just had this, Jesus, just give me the gifts. Okay. Stop, 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 stop. Okay. So once you've been in the life in the Spirit, guess what? You got the gifts. What you need to do is go from the upper room to the inner room. Because it's in the inner room where the weak are made strong. It's in the inner room where the gifts are fortified. It's in the inner room that you become one with the Savior and you live this reality that is no longer he, I that lives, but it is Christ who lives in me. 
So if you've been prayed with for the baptism of the Spirit, and all that stuff, don't, don't get me wrong. Please ask for God gifts. God's a generous giver. But I want to balance it. Just maybe you've got the gifts, but now you've got to focus on the inner room. You need to worship God and seek His face. And really give your life over to Him in prayer every day. And it's in that worship of God that we are strengthened. We are strengthened. He empowers us so that we can walk boldly in the gifts He already gave us at Pentecost. It's really true. Upper room to the inner room. Upper room to the inner room. It's all about becoming a gift of self. So so I've been a priest 13 years. And uh, as you know, I, I said it earlier, right, we make promises to pray the liturgy of the hours. And, and, uh, and I take that promise very seriously. But I'm going to tell you something. For, uh, so I'm ordained 13 years. I'm going to say for the, for the first 10 years of my life, okay, I struggled to pray the liturgy of the hours. So like in my holy hour in, my, in the mornings, right, I would always make it the last thing that I do. Because I, like I have my prayers that I want, I, I, I love just kind of sitting in God's word and all that kind of stuff and, I just love doing that, right? And, and then I, so I would like spend, you know, so much time in that. And then like, oh, I got to do the hours now. Okay, yeah. And it's just like, you know, starting with dessert, right? And then, and then, then eating your broccoli, right? You know, that kind of thing. You know, I mean, not that I didn't try. I mean, I, I prayed with sincerity. But I just, my approach was the scripture really feeds me that personal reflection. That other stuff doesn't really feed me. And so I just put it off to the end and then just, just get it done. Faithfully, but just get it done. The Lord God, he's so, so merciful, so merciful, so merciful. He gave me this profound insight into praying the breviary. And, uh, and I want to share it with you. And, it's it's in, and this, is why, this is where this talk comes out of. And it's this. It's like, Matt, maybe the liturgy hours isn't really about you, but it's really about an opportunity to give yourself as a gift of love to me. Because like the Psalms are hymns, right? And, and so many of them are, are, are hymns of love and of praise. And so like it's just this whole thing that like the Liturgy of the Hours, like it's an opportunity for me to give God a gift. And I'll be honest, so, so then like just flip that, then maybe sometimes my prayer can be a little self-serving. Now granted, I, I don't want to go to extremes here and I don't overgeneralize, okay? But like if the prayer is always about me, 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 right? And, and reflecting on the scriptures that touch me, not negative. The Lexa Divina, it's all wonderful things, right? But a relationship is two-way. There's a giving and a receiving. It's both and. It's not just about receiving. It's about giving, offering a gift. Jesus loves to be loved. He really does. God loves to be loved. And I would add this. If we think about this, life in the Holy Spirit, right? Life in the Holy Spirit. We say God, the Trinity, is an eternal communion of love, an eternal exchange of love, right? And as we heard earlier, right? The Holy Spirit, the love shared between Father and Son, eternally shared, right? So really, if, if we're called to a life in the Spirit, God's an eternal exchange of love, and the Spirit is love between, then you and I, a life in the Spirit, is a life in the heart of the Trinity, It's a life in the heart of the Blessed Trinity. What, like, we're like getting tossed around. Like the father's like, oh, I love you so much. And she's like, no, no, send him back here. Send him back here. Like, oh, I love him so much. No, send him back. Right? And they're sharing. They're sh- I'm in there. You're in there. Like we're getting, gee, we're on Jesus' lap right now. And the father's like, no, no, I want, I want Matt over here. Like, okay, I'll let him share over here. But think about this. A life in the spirit, Right? If the Spirit is the love between Father and Son, my life, I need to spend more time in heaven. And so prayer is receiving and giving. Right? It's receiving and giving. It's Because the, 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 the Trinity is the eternal gift and reception of gift. Right? The Father loves the Son, the Son receives and gives, loves the Father back. It's, it's gift given and received. That's what our prayer ought to be. That's what worship is. Gift given, gift received. Gift given, gift received. So worship is about gift given. And Jesus is so generous. He never gets outdone in generosity. When you give gifts, Jesus gives you back more than you could ever imagine. Upper room to inner room. Power, purpose, identity, who you are, who God is. Holy Spirit, come. It's like you now enter into the song of songs. You enter into the song of songs. 
Do you know that, like, for the mystics, the mystics, like, they write most about the Song of Songs. They live in the Song of Songs. Have you ever even, you even know, know there was a Song of Songs? You even know the or Song of Solomon, right? The mystics, they live there. Because it's this beautiful, romantic love story. The Lord loves us like a lover. He's the bridegroom. He's the bridegroom. And the ultimate gift of himself on the cross. Do we receive that gift? And we're invited in many ways to enter into that. Into that intimate union with Christ. I love the word, the, 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 the anecdote of breaking open the word, defining the word intimacy, right? Intimacy. Into me see. Into me see. That's intimacy, right? If you think about it, right? Intimacy with God is we're allowing God into me, see? I'm allowing him to see. Now, he's the God of the universe. He does that anyways, right? But I'm, al- I'm opening that up to him. And he does the same. His pierced heart opens wide for all of us. Into me see. The worship of God. So it's like the story of, of that, that couple that's been married, you know, 60 years, 50 years. Say 50 years, and they're taking a long drive, and she's all the way by the door, and he's driving, he's all by the other door. And she's saying, oh, do you remember the days we used to take the drives, and it was so wonderful? He's like, oh, yeah. And she's like, remember how we used to be so close, and I used to hold you? And He's like, yeah. She's like, what happened to those days? He's like, honey, I never moved. So all the married folks laughed, and all the like the single people were like, huh, what? I don't know. But that's what sin does, right? That's what shame and guilt and our stuff does. It moves us away from the God. Never moves. It moves us away from Him, right? Worship brings us back, shakes that stuff down, and then brings us into that embrace with our God. I want to show you a video. So I just just a little quick video. So. We, you know, marriage, right, this beautiful sacrament of marriage is, is meant to point us to the ultimate marriage feast of heaven. It points us to, to Christ's love for his church and that, that embrace that we're invited to with our God, right? It's a sacramental sign pointing us to this reality of becoming one with our God. So I, I celebrated a wedding a couple of years ago, and uh, at the wedding reception, Colin gets up there and gets his guitar and sings this song to his bride. I just want you to, I just want you to uh, watch this video. If you need me in the middle of night, my dear, I'll stay away till morning light and chase away your fears. So come closer. Right here forever Deep in my heart, babe Together as one My only That was, my, I, that was my homemade video, so sorry for the people walking by the screen, you know. So w- after he sang that song, we were probably halfway through. I was like, can we just leave and let them be alone? Like, let's just get out of here, you know. <laughs> and what's really funny was just kind of like, you know, all the women are like, oh. And all the guys are like, oh, man. I'm in trouble. <laughs> so this is a really, another true story, okay? Really true story. I was on my, uh, my annual priest retreat. This is about two years ago. And uh, it was a silent directed retreat. And in silent directed, Ignatian style, you get priest, you know, your spiritual director gives you scriptures to reflect on. And so you go off and you have so many prayer hours and then you report back the next day, right? So, um, and you're supposed to like, you pray with the scriptures, you use imaginative prayer, contemplation, um, Lexio Divina, you know, however the Holy Spirit moves you to, to pray with the scriptures. So, I kid you not, at some point during the week, I start praying, 
And uh, I prayed all week, don't get me wrong. But some week, I, 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 as I'm, I open my holy hour, and I'm, I'm entering in, and I hear Colin singing. And I'm like, Colin, get out of my retreat. <laughs> like, leave me alone, right? And he keeps singing and singing, and, over, and it won't stop. And I'm like, all right, stop it, stop it, be quiet, shh, stop it. You know, I'm, tr- I'm trying to pray, you know. Stop it, you know. <laughs> so then, Holy Spirit kicks in. Jesus was singing that, singing that to me. <laughs> and I listened to it probably about a hundred times. The longer version, the longer mat. Well, I had him, but I went quick over the, the longer version because you only got a minute there. And people going by in the video is kind of annoying, you know. Um, but it was just this profound reality of how much Jesus loves me and, like, desires me, wants to be best friends, wants to be my everything. And that's worship that brings us into Holy Communion. And if you think of the Mass, we go from the sacrifice of the Mass to Holy Communion. And these outline, these two things, the sacrifice and communion, really kind of shape what worship is all about. Where we sacrifice, we give Him our hearts and our wills, because it's hard to do that. That's hard, that's hard stuff. But it's so important. We're we're set free like the, the chains break. We start to awake. And then he brings us into his heart. And you know what? Again, he never moves. The reason why we're afraid to go to that heart is because we're looking in the mirror and we're like, I can't go there. I'm not worthy. And guess what? You, No one is. He makes you worthy. He desires you. He desires us even in my unloveliness, if I were to use that. He desires all of us. When he says, come to me, all of you. Think about that in the singular, all of you. In other words, don't just bring your good stuff. Bring all of you to me. That's what he's inviting us to. He desires you. He desires you. And when you can, I, and I can enter into that embrace and that worship, we get a whole new perspective. We are awakened. And then we can go into those coma zones as a new creation in Christ. That's the power of worship. That's what our God is inviting us to. We begin to drink deeply of the Holy Spirit, the new wine of the Holy Spirit. We start to experience what eye has not seen and ear has not heard and is neither entered into the human heart what God has prepared for those who love him. We start to drink deeply of the Spirit. We start to experience the things of heaven. We enter into self-forgetfulness. Self-forgetfulness. It's not about me. It's not about me. It's not about me. Self-forgetfulness. So brothers and sisters, the Father desires worshipers. He desires worshipers. The Father desires worshipers. Will you make a commitment to worship God every day? To give him your heart in prayer. To offer him your life. To go there. The movements of the Mass provide wonderful ways for worship every single day. First and foremost is the sacrificial gift of self. Hymns of praise. Spiritual songs. Repentance. Scripture. Abiding in the Scripture. Contemplation. Becoming one with God. The components of the Mass become wonderful ways by which we can worship God every single day. Certainly going to Mass every day is a wonderful thing. But not everybody can get there. We're created for worship. We're created for worship. And now is the time for the church to awake, brothers and sisters. God has created you for such a time as these. Amen? Amen. He's created you for such a time as these. As these, And it's time to awake. It's time to awake to the theodrama. It's time to awake to the truth of who God is and who you are. It's time to awake to the truth of God's purposes and power for your life. 
And it begins with worship. Let's stand and worship God.